we are a software engineer for a company that is named Axonic, but today we are here in a completely different guise and a well-defined target. Today, we are here to kill the aggregate. So for those that are not familiar with the aggregate, uh, the aggregate has always been one of the most controversial and weakest element of domain-driven design for me. Its uh, definition is, in my opinion, quite vague. An aggregate is a cluster of associated objects that we treat as uh, a unit for the purpose of, of data changes. So, uh, from personal experience, I can say that during my consultancy, uh, consulting activity, I have noticed that the full understanding of the aggregate concept remains very difficult for many. It is easy to make modeling mistakes, and uh, these mistakes uh, will be difficult to be fixed later. So, as a result, a certain percentage of developers feels that the whole architecture is overcomplicated. So let's try to clarify. Yeah. So once again, uh, we are going to consult the Blue Book to help us bridge this gap from theory to practice, right? And let's see what the Blue Book says. So the Blue Book says that we should cluster the entities and value objects into aggregates and define boundaries around each. Uh, that we should choose one entity to be the root of each aggregate and control all access to the objects inside the boundary through the root. And we should allow external objects to hold reference to the root only. This feels somewhat, I would say, theoretical, maybe too much theoretical. It definitely does not help us when you want to build intuition, when you want to be, build instinct into designing systems and deciding, OK, how are we going to group these things together, and so on and so on. So what we uh, prepared for today, as you may already notice, is the presentation uh, that is themed by the Quentin Tarantino movie Kill Bill. And we have chosen five villains from the movie, which are going to represent basically five pitfalls of an aggregate. So let's begin. So to better understand the criticalities of the aggregate, let's simulate a simple modeling exercise using event storming. So the domain is educational domain, and the rules are the following. First, a course cannot accept more than N students. And second, the curse capacity can change any time to any positive integer that is different from the current one. Even if the number of currently subscribed students is larger than the new value. So in this case, the course will not be able to accept any new enrollment until a sufficient number of unsubscribes have taken place to ensure that the number of subscribers is once again, below the capacity. So first of all, we identify the events. After the course has been created, it may happen that a student subscribes to the course, and also it may happen that is it unsubscribes. We know that from time to time, the course capacity may be updated. And we can now move analyzing the command that triggered these events. In our example, all these events are triggered by commands sent by the user through the UI. So, so far, so good. This process is pretty simple, is natural. And this is thanks to the storytelling. Yeah, because one of the most powerful elements of domain driven design is that. It has broken down the barriers between technicians and domain experts, thanks to tools capable of exploiting the mesh potential of storytelling. First of all, even storming, for example. And storytelling is a, an extremely effective technique because it is innate in human nature. You don't need any special competence or skill to tell a story. Storytelling really helped us breaking down the communication barrier between technicians and domain experts. 
in my experience, the fluidity of the discovery process that is amazing uh, at the beginning hits a snag when we try to introduce the aggregate into the story. Indeed, by definition, the aggregate represents the resolution of a technical aspect. The aggregate represents the boundary of strong consistency, and it is the guardian of the invariance. Indeed, from Blue Book, we can uh, read that when a change to any object with the aggregate boundary is committed, all invariants of the whole aggregate must be satisfied. The aggregate is the component responsible for ensuring strong consistency constraints within an ecosystem that is by nature eventually consistent. But at the same time, we uh, try to um, find in the, in the aggregate uh, the business entity acting as the guardian of a set of business rules. It is complex to explain to business experts what it really represents. And obviously, we cannot provide business experts with a technical explanation of the aggregate. But as a technician, to design the aggregate, what I do is to try to group all data that shares consistency constraints. So in our example, the rules were related to the course. And that's why I, I would choose the course as an aggregate. Translating this idea into non-technical terms to explain it to the business experts is not trivial. We can use metaphors by asking questions like, who guarantees me that this rule will not be violated? Or in which box could you put this information? Or who do you address this common to? These are all techniques that can work, but they are not always so effective. So this is the first bad guy in our story. The aggregate does not fit with storytelling. So the introduction of the aggregate into storytelling breaks the fluidity of the discovery process because it is an element that does not emerge naturally from the story. It's us technicians that we try to forcefully introduce it to satisfy our needs. So the aggregate was created to respond to a technical requirement and business experts should not absolutely worry about understanding any technical aspect of our architecture. And nevertheless, they are somehow asked to identify precisely these elements that are technical by definition. Furthermore, the aggregate brings our attention back to this data structure away from the behavior. Yes, and now in front of us, we have a second villain, and that is that aggregate mixes technical and business aspects. Usually in our minds, we have our vision of the domain, right? How we mentally envision uh, the domain. Uh, but there are also some invariants that are at the beginning, maybe not so obvious. Uh, so those invariants are business invariants, and sometimes they may involve more than one business uh, concept, domain concept that we have in our head. And usually we struggle to marry these two uh, views uh, on the domain. What people, uh, what some people, not everybody, of course, but I would say a smaller group of people try to do is try to group data that change together uh, into groups and then uh, form aggregates around them. However, it is not so easy to do so, and especially at the beginning when you're not uh, so sure about your dom domain, you're not so sure uh, which uh, data will change together. Nevertheless, what is more common to be done is we go to the board, we observe the, uh, the outcome of our event storming process, here we have our commands and events, and we try to search for names. We try to search for entities, for nouns. In our case, that is going to be the course, which will result in the course aggregate, which is responsible for handling these specific commands for creation, subscription, unsubscription, and updating the course capacity. 
and it is also responsible for publishing corresponding events. Now, when we uh, move to, I would say, more physical world, uh, we need to store this durably. And there are a few ways how to store this durably. But the first one that is in front of us is to store the current state of our aggregate. So we have a course and a bunch of subscriptions. Now, when we have commands to subscribe and unsubscribe students to and from course, uh, we are going to load the whole aggregate, which in this uh, situation is absolutely necessary because we are dealing with subscription and we need to load everything. And the other more, maybe not so obvious reason is that our aggregate is guardian of consistency. That's why we need to load it whole, right? But what happens when we need to uh, execute the added course capacity command? Uh, we know that only uh, course uh, entity is the one that we need to uh, load in order to execute this command. However, because of the nature of the aggregate, we also need to load subscriptions. And this is, uh, I would say, something that is not necessary to be done at this step. Uh, this is uh, when we were talking about the state uh, stored aggregates. When we move to the event sourced aggregates, so uh, cases where aggregate is stored as a series of events that were published by it uh, in, his, in, in the past, uh, the story is somewhat similar. For subscribe and unsubscribe commands, we are going to load all the events, rehydrate the current state of the aggregate, and then execute the commands. Again, in this um, situation, this is necessary. But in cases uh, when we want to uh, run the update course capacity command, we only need these two events. However, because of uh, guaranteeing the consistency, we need to load all events published by this aggregate. Again, something that is uh, not necessary to be done. So now let's add another business rule, a new business rule. The course title can change any time to any different title, uh, to any title that is different from the current one. So back to the board. We need to, to introduce a new event. The course has been renamed and uh, a new command, of course. And um, if we ask to the domain her experts, who should this command to be sent to, very likely they will answer to the curse. So the curse aggregate is now responsible for something more than before. And it may seem irrelevant, but it hides a pitfall. And let me introduce you the third villain in our story. The larger the aggregate, the greater the contention. So the natural attitude that we have to identify aggregates in the business concepts that are part of our mental model can lead to an expansion of the boundaries of the aggregate that sometimes it is not necessary. Every time we identify a new event that pertains to a certain mental concept, we tend to assign it to the respective aggregate. But it is paramount to remember, to keep in mind that the boundary of consistency, it is also the boundary of concurrency. And for this reason, the correct sizing of the aggregate can significantly affect application performance. If we decide absurdly to model our system as a single large aggregate, this would prevent any form of concurrent access and all operations should be performed sequentially as they relate to a single aggregate, which would act as a contention point. And of course, this is not what we want. So suppose that the system receives concurrently two commands related to the same course. The first requires the capacity of the curse to be updated and the second requires the curse to be renamed. Our instinct uh, tells us immediately that these two operations will not conflict. They do not influence each other. Both commands are handled at the same time. That means that two replicas of the same aggregate instance are loaded 
Each is updated based on the command being handled and the problem arise when you try to persist the transaction. Since the aggregate guarantees the internal consistency, it is not possible to accept two concurrent modifications. And while the first of the two transactions will be accepted, the second one will be necessarily rejected. It doesn't matter that within the aggregate, the modified data are completely independent. It doesn't matter that changing the title of the curse will never affect changing its capacity as well as the, po the opposite. The only fact that two commands are managed by the same instance of the aggregate is sufficient to prevent them from being executed simultaneously. So assigning both commands of these, both uh, these commands, right, of, of, of this instance of the aggregate calls an increase in the contention that would not be necessary. As we know that the information they modify has no reciprocal implication. So nevertheless, it must be handled sequentially since they are part of the same aggregate. Yes, enough of complaining. Let's try to propose an alternative solution. Let's try to see whether we can solve this uh, contention problem that Sarah was explaining. So uh, previously we had a single aggregate that was responsible for dealing uh, with details about the course and also the subscriptions. Now, what I would like to propose is an alternative solution that has two aggregates. One is course info that is responsible for uh, dealing with course details and of course subscription aggregate that is responsible for dealing uh, with subscriptions. Let's observe what are the pros and cons of these two. So on the left-hand side, we have a course and on the right-hand side, we have a course info and course subscription. So one versus two. Uh, we have more contention uh, with the single aggregate. This is what Sarah already explained, uh, but this is simpler. It is simpler in a way that we basically uh, have only one thing to deal with. When we are creating the course, we only create this single aggregate. When we are closing the course, we are uh, closing or deleting this single aggregate. Uh, on the other side, uh, we have less contention. Uh, this is achieved by splitting aggregate into two. And now we can uh, uh, finally find, uh, find the uh, correct aggregate. So we are going to route our commands to the correct aggregate, which will, as an effect, uh, lessen the contention. But on the other uh, hand, we also have additional complexity, and that is management of multiple aggregates. What does it mean? It means whenever we want to create now the course, we need to go and create, cor create course info and course subscriptions. Uh, when we want to close the course, we need to close two aggregates. Uh, what would happen if one of these closing or creation commands fail? Uh, we need to go and uh, uh, compensate for that action. So basically uh, closing the previous aggregate, so deleting it, et cetera, et cetera. So it definitely increases the complexity. And let's say now that we were using a single aggregate approach, it was for some time in production and we were storing uh, decisions, we were storing the, the state of our aggregate. And now we, we have seen that there is uh, a lot of contention on that single aggregate. So what we want to do now is we want to migrate from a single aggregate approach to two aggregate approach. That basically means our model with, will change. Now, what are we going to do? Because we have the structure of our model already stored. If we are in the state-resisted aggregate world, uh, basically uh, it is not such a, a big drama. Uh, we can, usually they're stored in SQL databases, so we can just run a script uh, to update the columns, update the relations, et cetera, et cetera. It can get a little bit more complex in cases when we are serializing the state of our aggregate and uh, storing it as a blob, because in that case we need to load the aggregate, uh, to deserialize it, uh, adapt the relations, and then serialize it again and store it. But it is not the end of the world. Uh, the really big issue comes with the event source aggregates, right? Uh, why is that? It is because in the 
nature of events and event stores is that they are immutable. They are not to be changed. We shouldn't mess with the stream of events and we should also not uh, delete events. We should not change events, etc., etc. So it makes our life a little bit more uh, difficult. But let's go a little bit deeper into the example just to see what it would mean to, to change the event source aggregate. So this is a situation where we had a single aggregate. It had um, uh, some events persisted. Now we want to move from a single aggregate approach to two aggregate approach. Uh, first of all, we need, instead of single event, course created event, we need to introduce two events. And it's course subscriptions created and course info created. Now we need to go and follow the stream of events and change the ownership for each of these events. So course renamed event now will become part of the course info aggregate and course capacity change events will become a part of the course subscriptions aggregate. This is something that creates headaches for uh, people who are building event stores because this is not something that it is a normal operation. Uh, some event stores support this. It is not the end of the world. There are techniques uh, to be used to achieve uh, these kinds of refactorings, but it is not an easy task to do. Which brings us to our fourth um, villain in the story, and that is that aggregates are hard to refactor. I will repeat once again, it is not impossible, but definitely not a breeze of a task to be done. So let's add now a little more spice to our example introducing a new rule, the student cannot join more than 10 courses. So back to the board, we need a new event for the creation of the student and uh, the relative command. But here, things get complicated because I need a new event for the subscription and a new event for unsubscription both triggered by their respective commands. So, have you a feeling of uh, deja vu? You should, because uh, we have already met very similar events and commands when we were thinking about the curse. But now I need two more, because the new rule that uh, I introduce that uh, I have to be able to guarantee is relative to a new aggregate, this, uh, the student aggregate. So why we need two separate events that represent the same event in real life? The reason is because they belong to two different aggregates. So this is an inconvenience, let's say, uh, but let's, uh, for now, say that uh, we are happy with this definition of the student aggregate that is capable of handling some commands and emitting some events. So also the student aggregate, exactly as the um, course aggregate, will contain the subscriptions. They are necessary to make decisions regarding following subscription and unsubscription requests. This situation forces us to introduce some form of synchronization. So anytime the request to subscribe a student to curse uh, need to be handled, uh, we, we need to um, introduce a component able to deliver the respective commands to both the student and the curse aggregate. So the student and the curse then publish their respective events. That is simple enough, unless one of the two aggregates refuses the command. For example, when the course is fully booked. In this case, the orchestrator component must react accordingly by sending a second command to the student to request the cancellation of the previous subscription. This is just one of the possible solution there might be several others. In any case, it requires a form of synchronization that increases the complexity of our solution. So here you are the fifth and final villain in our story. 
Transaction that spans multiple aggregates could cause unnecessary complexity. <coughs> Sorry. So the main aspect underlying the idea of the aggregate is the concept of boundary. The aggregate is the boundary of consistency, but also the boundary of complexity. Yes, because one of the purpose of the aggregate is precisely to contain this complexity, defining small bubbles isolated from each other to have a minimal context where it is easy to make decisions. And this concept perfectly uh, matches the best practices of uh, the coupling and I cohesion. And even if the intention is great, anyway, it implies greater complexity whenever there is a constraint that spans more than one aggregate. So you could answer me, after all, it is nothing more than a long transaction. What is wrong with that? Certainly nothing is wrong with that. And it is an absolutely normal and common uh, solution when the transaction crosses the boundary of bounded context. But I wonder how much it is actually necessary to introduce this complexity when the long transaction takes place in, within the same bounded context in the same software component. So it is possible to avoid this complexity inside the same bounded con context. We will answer very soon to this question. So here they are all the negative elements of the aggregate. The aggregate does not fit the storytelling. It moves the focus from the behavior to the model. It mixes technical and business aspects. It can cause unnecessary contention and complexity. And in some cases, it is difficult to refactor. So we just need to shut it down. Yes. So we've been thinking whether there is a better way to implement the command model. And unfortunately, we didn't find any solution. So this is going to be a really short presentation today. So sorry for that, just listening to us complaining about the, the algorithm. But of course, not. Uh, we decided let's, instead of focusing on the structure of the model, let's try to focus on the behavior, right? So let's see what would change. What would change if we restart from the storytelling? If you observe our system uh, as a series of actions and reactions uh, that are reacting to those actions, uh, we find some gaps, right? So what is in the middle? In the middle uh, are decision blocks, are the ones who are making a uh, decision based on a certain action. It can be a person, so a lady in this case, uh, a lady can based on her experience, but also based on the information that she gathers from the system, can make a decision and uh, act on it, making an action. As another decision block, uh, we could have a software component that could similarly as the, the lady take a look at the system and the history of the system and retrieve all the necessary information make the decision and react to this specific action. We can also observe these actions and reactions as commands and events. So let's see uh, what is this going to change, basically. So uh, we are going to focus on the decision. In this situation, the decision block is our message handler, could be a command handler or event handler, really depends on the, on the use case. Uh, now the message handler knows exactly what it needs to make the decision. So it will uh, go and, and uh, search for a specific information in the system. It knows where to look. And another really important ingredient in this story is event sourcing. And why is that? Uh, it is because event sourcing uh, decouples the persistence from the model needed for taking the decision. Right? So we can easily uh, change and adapt our model regardless of how we store it. And now uh, the message handler that we talked 
previously about it, you'll use this benefit and it will build on the fly any model needed for making the decision, uh, basically just looking at the event streams and gathering all the necessary events. Uh, when it comes uh, to, to practice, uh, this is what it would look like. So we, here we have an event store that has some events related to the course and related to the uh, student. Uh, there is a necessity for us to handle the update course capacity command. Uh, previously, we needed to go to the event store and load all these events. So course created, course renamed, and course capacity changed. But when you take a look at our requirements, when you take a look what our message handler, command handler in this case needs to do, it basically uh, needs to uh, check whether the course exists and it needs to check whether the new capacity is different from the previous one. So it essentially doesn't need this course renamed event. So let's try not to load it. Why would we load it if it is not necessary? So let's load only necessary events made a decision as a, and as a consequence, we may decide, okay, let's publish a course capacity changed event or let's not publish it depending on uh, the outcome of our decision. But the bottom line is just focus on what we need. When it comes to the event store, there are things that need to be adapted. So instead of loading events based uh, on the aggregate identifier, you're going to stream those events based on a specific query. Let's zoom in into this stream query. Stream query is composed of two things. The first one is domain identifiers. So domain identifiers are basically identifiers of specific domain concepts that we are interested in. In our case, that would be the course, a course with its uh, corresponding specific ID. The other component would be types, because we are not interested in all events related to this course, but only in course created and course capacity changed events. Essentially, these two type um, of information will form a string query. OK, once again, the focus is on the message handler. Uh, we have less waste of resources because we are loading only what is necessary. So we are going to save on the network bandwidth, on the CPU, memory, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we do not need to do any upfront modeling because we are going to uh, use or abuse uh, event sourcing in this case. And we can uh, decide later on to change our model and to load different events which gives us a greater flexibility. So we do not need to, okay, sit down, decide, decide on the structure of our model, run with it, and then have a lot of issues uh, when we want to change it. So we gain more flexibility. Let's see now what happened in case of concurrent write operations. So let's assume that the system receives the command to update the capacity of course and the one to update the title of the same course at the same time. So our instinct, as before, tells us that there can be no conflict between these two operations since they act on unrelated data. So the two decision blocks can simultaneously load their respective events stream to rebuild their respective state models. And uh, finally, they can publish their respective events. So, so far, so good. But what happens if the system receives at the same time the command to subscribe a student to a course and the command to update the capacity of the same course? So this time the risk of collision exists so both command handler can simultaneously load the event stream to reconstruct their models, their respective models. And suppose that the first block that is capable of publishing an event is the one related to the capacity update. And a few milliseconds later, the other block publish, publishes the subscription event. So in this case, it could happen that the capacity update that, is, that was emitted just a few milliseconds before 
could invalidate the choice made regarding the, the subscriptions. In fact, the last uh, first capacity change event had not been considered when the first handler reconstructed its model and can invalidate the decision. How can we handle this situation? So here is the second idea we would like to propose um, for the even store API. So next to the simple append operation, an event store should provide another operation, the conditional append. How does it work? So it is very simple. Besides the events to be appended, the conditional append requests an additional parameter, the condition. So this parameter, it is used to verify that when I invoke the append, there is no information that could affect my decision that I was not aware of. So let's see how does it work. The condition is composed of two parts. First of all, the string query. It is the query that has been used to rebuild the decision model from my handler. In other words, it is the query that was previously invoked by the decision block to retrieve all the events, all the information needed to make a decision. And second, the consistency maker, marker, sorry. The consistency marker um, represents the offset of the last event that was included into the decision model. In other words, it represents the fact that the message handler, at the moment it took the decision to publish some events, was up to date to that specific offset. So the condition is verified when no events after the consistency marker is matching the string query. So when the condition is verified, you have the guarantee that the decision block made its decision on the basis of the most up-to-date data. And when the condition is not verified, it means that there are events that could affect the decision and the message handler was not aware of. So when the condition is not verified, it means that the decision made it is potentially wrong. It's not said, but potentially is wrong because it is based on out-of-date data. I may have decided, for example, to accept a student's subscription when actually, just a moment before, the capacity of the course has been reduced to the point of preventing that subscription. And in that case, the append is rejected as the condition is not satisfied. So the decision block can then decide to fail or to try again by reloading the model, which this time will necessarily be more up to date than before. In practice, the conditional append represents the guarantee that an event or a group of events is published in the event store if and only if the event store does not contain any events that matches the query after the last expected one. So the conditional append represents the guarantee that the decision has been made on the basis on the most up-to-date data. You can think about the conditional append as a form of optimistic lock specific for even sourcing applications. So let's go back to the practical example. The first block to invoke the conditional append is the update curse capacity common handler. And since the last event in the event store at the time um, the model was loaded was the number 592, the event store checks that at the time of the pen, there are no new events after 592 that would have been part of the query. And since there is none, the pen is accepted. When the subscribe student course command handler tries to publish its event, it also invokes the conditional append. It also loaded the event number 592 as the last event. So the event store checks that at the time of append, there is an event, the number 593, <laughs> following the 592, which is part of the query stream. And in this case, the store 
rejects the pen. Yes. So let's focus again on the limited contention. So basically, just by reducing the number of events, we already have reduced contention. It comes natural, but let's let's uh, investigate this a little bit more, right? So previously we had the contention boundaries of the aggregate, and now contention boundaries are of the string query, right? And string query naturally already lo loads less events. So basically we are going to limit the contention there. And this is very nice and useful, but can we do more? Uh, we think yes, and it uh, relates to how we design our systems. I would like you to remember one thing that Sarah already explained, and that is this duplication, right? We have uh, commands to subscribe and unsubscribe, but also events to subscribe and unsubscribe to and from course. Uh, they are present in both streams, in the course and student streams. And this feels weird, this feels artificial, right? Uh, if you also take a look at the event store, we see these duplicates, right? We see these two events sitting next to each other. But the thing is, only one thing has happened, right? Students subscribed or unsubscribed to the uh, to the course. There is there was a single decision. Again, we have these duplicates. We want to explain this to our business experts, and we show them the uh, stream of events. They are going to act okay. What's this? What do we need these duplicates? And we know we need these duplicates because uh, we have two aggregates. We need to have consistency between uh, in, um, among them. And uh, this is purely technical reason, but we are polluting our event stream and we would like to avoid that. Let's see if we can do that. Let's focus on the uh, stream of events. It is what it is, right? First thing that you're going to do is let's remove the ownership. So let's introduce something that we call pure events. Those are events that re represent business facts, something that has happened and it is relevant to our business. But again, we need to relay those facts to our, uh, to our business domain. So we are going to introduce another layer uh, and those are tags, domain identifiers, and they are going to basically point to specific events. Let's remove the, the ones that we do not like. Uh, so we are leaving pure events and their corresponding tags. We have still the duplicates, but what we can do is basically just merge these uh, two events into a single event, but have two tags pointing to the same event. So we reduce contention even further because we are now able to remove these duplicates. And this grants us another exceptional advantage. So let's find out this advantage by analyzing how our system now behaves in managing a command for subscribing a student to a course. Now the message handler knows exactly what data it needs to make a decision and it knows the invariants to verify in order to publish the, subs the student subscribing to course event. And now it can take advantage of the flexibility of a query to retrieve both student and course data in a single stream. And this means that the command handler is now able to reconstruct the model necessary to evaluate in a single place, in a single moment, that the subscription does not violate the maximum number of students per course, nor the maximum number of course per student, but the business rule that we have. If both rules are validated, it will be possible to publish a single event related, however, to both business elements, the course and the student. And therefore, the, student, the, the event store should not only be able to append new events, but new domain events, where a domain event is nothing more than the pair formed by the pure event and the collection of domain identifiers matched to it. So in my example, the domain identifier is expressed by a key value pair, where the key represents the domain concept and the value represents the instance uh, identifier. So 
the domain identifiers are matched to a single event, to each single event. Two events that are published in the same transaction could be associated with different domain identifiers. Let's see an example. If after a student is subscribed, the curse reaches its maximum capacity, I may want to publish the curse fully booked event in the same transaction. The student subscribed to curse event will be associated with both student and the curse, while the curse fully booked event will be associated only with the curse. Let's uh, focus again on these pure events, right? Let's see their characteristics. So they are uh, events that do not belong to an aggregate, so there is no ownership on them. Uh, they represent a fact that is uh, relevant, important to the business, and only that. And they can be related to one or multiple domain concepts. And there are some benefits, right? So the first one is less complexity. Less complexity because there is no owner. Uh, the business decision can now easily involve several domain concepts and the decision is taken in one place. If you remember this example that Sarah was explaining earlier, this is uh, this type of synchronization is no longer needed when we are dealing with a single bounded context. We would still need uh, some form of synchronization mechanism when we want to go across bounded context. But in a single bounded context, since we are getting all events in a single place, we do not need this anymore. The, another benefit that we're going to have is more flexibility, again, focusing on the event sourcing because we have this decoupling. And it comes to the refactoring, right? Uh, it ends up with refactoring. Now, when you want to adapt our model, we are just going to change our string query. We are going to add or remove domain identifiers or event types. And this is it. This is how we deal with refactoring now. So the aggregate is finally dead, together with all the ne negative aspects associated with it. This new approach, uh, called dynamic consistency boundary or DCB for friends, uh, has several benefits. It integrates naturally into storytelling. It focuses on behavior instead of model. It reduces contention and, of course, complexity. And it simplifies their factoring. So the aggregate is dead, but be careful. This does not mean you need to organize the system with hundreds of completely unrelated common endings. Absolutely not. So clustering commands into logical groups and delegating their execution to the same model is and remains a correct programming approach. The difference lies in the fact that before, by the very definition of the aggregate, these models necessarily had to be isolated from each other. So killing the aggregate means admitting the possibility of contamination between these models without renouncing consistency. So a less dogmatic approach, which in any case must not disregard good programming practices, but which, thanks to a greater flexibility, allow the best design to emerge over time. So the ability to create this intersection between models does not necessarily have to be exploited in every situation. There will be thousands of cases where this is not necessary. As always, there is no a single answer or a single truth. Choices must always be made with pragmatism and common sense. So these are our uh, a way to contact us. And uh, please, if you can, we would like to know your feedback and your opinion about our talk. So go to our session page and share with us our, uh, your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you.